Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Very pleased to be joined again by my friend Jonah Goldberg, a senior editor at National Review, fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, author of books that have been written and are about ha- <laughs> that have been written or that are about to come out. That's right. What, what's your next one called? The next one, uh, the working title, we still may change it, is uh, "The Suicide of the West" because we're looking for something upbeat, uh, yeah, that's forward-looking. <laughs> you know, I-, I wanted to go with "Cheer Up" for the worst is yet to come, but. Um, <laughs> We decided okay. with something a little more serious. So. Okay, well, this conversation, I'm sure, will be suitably upbeat as yes. well. Yeah. So I think we last did a conversation almost exactly a year ago. We're now speaking in, what, mid-late October. Uh-huh. Uh, we did one right after the election, speculated about what might happen. I think some of us, where things might go. I'm not sure how those speculations stand up. Better than our election, pre-election predictions. Probably, probably yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> so where do you think? A year into the Trump presidency. I mean, where does the country stand? Where does, we'll talk about conservatism as well, the Republican Party. But let's just start with... What, what, what strikes you one way or the other about the country's fate and well-being? Yeah, um, I think, how to put this, one of my favorite lines from Orwell is where he says, um, a man can um, be a failure and take to drink and become all the more of a failure because he drinks, <laughs> right? So there's this catalytic thing. A lot of the problems that America has um, are not the product of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the product of those problems. But he's made a lot of those problems, I think, worse in terms of polarization, distrust of institutions, uh, distrust of certainly of the media, right, uh, which used to be our bread and butter. But like at some point, you know, every poison is determined by the dosage. Some things can go too far. And um, so I think civil society generally is in a really rotten place. Hmm. Um, I've just spent the last two years on this book working on it, which we'll talk about when my book comes out. <laughs> but um, I think that uh, one of the sort of long-term trends, you know, it's funny, it's like, I think President Trump has illuminated trends that we sort of recognized or talked about but didn't really worry about right. too much and, and met, uh, to mix metaphors, metastasize them in a way. Um, and one of them is, you know, for years we've talked about and complained about as conservatives the politicization of, of, daily life, right, of, of Hollywood, of entertainment, of, of education and all the rest. Um, what we're now seeing, what happens is, is that you actually get, it's a feedback loop. And if you um, politicize our life, if, if politics becomes a lifestyle, um, our lifestyles also become political. And uh, for the, for my understanding of the social science, this is the first time in American history where partisan identification is more predictive of behavior than race and often religion or gender, which is just bizarre, right? right. So politics has now become, uh, political identification has become a, a form of identity politics. And I think that things like Facebook and Twitter and social media um, accelerate and exacerbate these trends because as civil society atrophies, people still have this desire to belong to a community and they start looking to national politics. They start looking to um, social media groups, which are really pale imitations of real community. Virtual communities aren't real communities. And in the virtual community world of Facebook and, and whatnot, it's all so incredibly tribal and polarized. And people become abstractions. And, and so in a, in a very serious way, I, I think the country's in, got real problems because we view politics now as essentially a form of entertainment. And um, uh, the whole notion of deliberative democracy is uh, really on the outs. It's just all about victory. Um, for years, I've been, you know, my favorite New Yorker cartoon has a, which I might even brought up in the last time I did this because I talk about it all the time, but my favorite New Yorker cartoon has a, two dogs in suits drinking martinis at a New York bar, and one dog says to the other dog, you know, it's, it's not good enough that dogs succeed. Cats must also fail. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's, I think, where we are politically, is that everything is zero sum. We take sort of ecstatic schadenfreude when the news fits our narrative rather than somebody else's narrative. One of the most repugnant things, hopefully when this airs, there won't have been a recent mass shooting but because uh, it'll seem like I'm talking about it, but there has the most recent one we had was a few weeks ago in Las Vegas. But there's this really grotesque, almost vampiric pause 
where right. everybody's waiting to find out whether it it's, was a Muslim right. or a crazy Christian, right? right. And then right. one side gets to say, ha-ha, your side's the problem, and the other side gets to say, ha-ha, your side's the problem. And it's grotesque, and it's ghoulish, but that's where our politics are right now. Yeah, the Gold Star Parents controversy that is right. just, just happening this week is almost stomach-turning, really, I find it. So, but, so but you're good on this these kind of deep, kind of semi-deep <laughs> cultural analyses. <laughs> well, deep in your case, semi-deep. Like semi-deep in my case. Yeah, but I, I, I like to claw back, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was, I said it, I thought, well. <laughs> but look, I mean, so these two, I very much agree with what you just said. And so how do these two things happen at once? You have high partisanship, tribalism, right. to a really unhealthy degree, and I think maybe unprecedented degree in America on the one hand, and on the other, entertainment, culture, politics is reality TV. You'd think those two are sort of cut against each other, no? I mean, one is kind of politics is childish, politics is all about personality. Trump is not an ideological figure. Right. We didn't elect Ted Cruz or nominate Ted Cruz and elect Ted Cruz or whatever, Bernie Sanders. And, and yet, on the other hand, it does seem like in a weird way they're they go together more than I would have thought, I guess. I mean, you know yeah, I, mean? I, mean, I, I think one of the ironies is is that... Um, I mean, it's like we have bread and circuses. So in my image of decline, there are two kinds of decline. Bread and circuses decline. Everyone's just distracted. Right. And decadent. Decadent yeah. trivialities. Or insane partisanship leading to civil war. We seem to have, like, combined both of them. How did that, yeah, how, although, how you know, did that work? It's funny. Um, I mean, you're a better student in history than I am, but it may be that they always went together. Well, that's a good point. Well, you know, that's just, a question. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like it from the from the vantage point of the present. Um, but I think uh, one of the ironies of the situation that we're in is I, like, I, I think that Steve Bannon and his whole argument, both in terms of American history and his political project, are way overblown and really fairly spurious. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, there are only two constituencies in America that are deeply invested in the myth of Bannon's genius, and it's the Bannonistas themselves, primarily the bright, bright crowd, and the mainstream media, who are just sort of desperate right. to inflate his importance. They're trying to sort of turn him into what you were in the 1990s with the fight on Hillary Care, right? right. They need a narrative villain person to do the Republicans in disarray talk and all the rest. And, uh, and I think that, but the thing is, his argument, such as it is, becomes more plausible the longer Washington gets nothing done, right? The more dysfunctional Washington, the less productive it is, the easier it is to watch it all as a spectator sport, right? Then it really is just about the personalities. Okay. And um, um, I think that you know what Trump did was he broke the blood-brain barrier between reality television and professional wrestling culture and political culture. And... Uh, it was actually a blogger who's actually very pro-Trump now, much to my astonishment, uh, but a brilliant guy, Ace of Spades. Um, he was the guy who sort of clicked on a light for me, oh, a couple years ago, what he called the MacGuffinization of American politics. Hmm. And I've written about it a bunch since, and I think it really is pretty insightful. Um, in film, a MacGuffin is just whatever the hero wants, right? Um, it's in, like a plot device, right? It's a plot it, device, it gets right? gets things going, I guess, right? Yeah, so in, the, missing, pulp in the Pulp Fiction, the it's the briefcase, Falcon, right? And the Maltese yeah. Falcon is the classic MacGuffin, right? right. It's just something that, that from which the hero's motives derive, right? I, I must get the plans for this nuclear code. I must find the missing baby, whatever it is. And, <clears throat> and Ace pointed out that the coverage of Barack Obama for eight years um, from the elite media was completely MacGuffinized. Once President Obama set sights on a desired goal, all of the news coverage was, will he get it? Will the Republicans stop him? Um, it didn't matter. So Obama could spend, what, a year, two years going around saying, it is flatly unconstitutional for me to do DAPA and DACA and all this kind of stuff. And the moment he switches gears and does it, almost no one in the mainstream press says, well, wait a second. You said this was unconstitutional. No one, no, the New York Times editorial page doesn't scream bloody murder. The president is violating his oath of office. It was all about the hero, the protagonist in the story of politics is succeeding. And I think it explains a lot of the frustration of conservatives about how Obama was treated as president. You know, there were no scandals and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but it also explains now that the shoe's on the other foot enormous amount of the psychological thinking that goes into defending Donald Trump. It's that he's our hero. We have to rationalize our, dis you know, for the people with a conscience, it is we have to rationalize our choice of, of electing this guy, of supporting this guy, 
and so we need to give him wins regardless of ideological content. And for the people who are all in, you know, the true Kool-Aid drinkers, it is simply a cult of personality and whatever he declares a victory, we must echo um, is a victory as well. And uh, the entire discussion of politics now is is almost like, you know, it's it's it's, it's movie synopsis work. Yeah. It's not it's not about actual public policy issues. It's about you know, will our hero succeed? And for the left, will our villain fail? And I, at, at some point, it just gets tedious. I mean, I guess one argument that well, okay, so now I'm depressed about the culture, the civic culture. <laughs> um, I mean, one argument I've made occasionally is the institutions you could argue have done pretty well. I and mean, we're not a third world that. country. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I no, mean, I agree with that. I agree with that. That, that. that he can't, you know, one bad president, one bad dictator in Argentina, one bad president who assumes dictatorial authorities in a, Argentina, just use one country, uh, in a third world country can really destroy almost the yeah. political system. That doesn't seem to be the case here. No, I think that's right. But let's not forget that our institutions of civil society, I mean, the constitutional framework, right, and the, the military, the ethos, the patriotic ethos of the generals around Trump have helped enormously, I yes, think. Yes, I right? agree with that. Um, and it's funny that we're so dependent on the military you know, we were talking to, about keep civil, to keep civil government, uh, you know, s uh, government uh, sound, right? Yeah, and, and we should be clear. I mean, I don't think Donald Trump is Hitler, right? I mean, uh, Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, totally. There's yeah. something else going on there. Right? I, yeah. I think the desire to invest in Donald Trump uh, ideological coherence or authority. I mean, he's, he's the talent, as they say in Hollywood. He's just the guy who um, wants to make sure his trailer is bigger than everybody else's trailer and he gets two scoops of ice cream on his plate and he doesn't really care about the policy stuff. I, he does demonstrate how fragile our system is insofar as imagine if he really right. understood, imagine if he had Pat Buchanan's brain and Trump's ability to rally the troops, right. it'd be a very different country. And um, uh, but just getting outside of the sort of the inside the Beltway part, I mean, our institutions are in really bad shape. The family's in bad shape. Um, uh, faith and trust in institutions across the board is way down. You look at um, you know the religious right, which I've spent and you spent most of your career defending, right, right from crazy liberal attacks. Their ability to instantaneously rationalize yeah, um, Donald Trump's personal behavior. I mean, I, like, I, I understand he's a flawed figure and all that kind of stuff, but um, the number of people who see him as God's instrument and, um, and 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 think it's unfair or unworthy to to condemn his personal behavior from the Christian right is is astonishing to me, um, and it shows you both how beleaguered and desperate. And, uh, and, and frightened a lot of people on the right are that they really did think that we were one election away from America ending. Um, but also just shows you how much the entire country is invested in politics from Washington, which is a sign of the erosion of civil society. Um, people, for most of American history, people look much closer to home for their politics, for their meaning, for their sense of belonging. And instead, as civil society lowers, the entire national culture turns on the reality show of Washington politics and roots for the bad guy, root, roots for the their their tribe. And it's, it is, I think, a, we're in a bad place in that way. You've used the term rationalizing a couple of times, and uh -huh. we've discussed this over the months of the Trump presidency, the degree to which people, they start off saying, I don't like him much, I wish he wouldn't tweet, oh, his character's bad, but we're getting Judge Gors Justice Gorsuch and we're getting some other things, religious freedom legislation or something, and so we, we, we should, we gotta go with him. And it doesn't seem like many people can hold that position. It's not a, a, at all a ridiculous position. It's not quite where I am, but I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it was the most, in my view, sensible sure. vote, reluctant vote for Trump position, reluctant support Trump position. Don't go crazy about his flaws, but acknowledge them. But it's, what is it about psychology? It just does seem that it's hard for people to hold that. They want to believe somehow. They, it's, it's hard to be a reluctant supporter somehow, either in today's America or maybe just in life in general, frankly. I mean, you know. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I think that's right. And, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's funny. It's different horses for different courses um, in terms of the arguments that you get. And I've, it's interesting. 
social media makes everything worse, right? Um, and uh, hey, we're active on social media, and I'm very know. active on yes. that. But I, a lot, about half of it is pictures of my dogs. Yeah. Um, and uh, and cable definitely makes everything worse to a certain extent. And but when you actually go out and talk to rank and file conservatives, it's 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 shocking how rare you find the true Kool Aid drinkers. I mean, yeah, you you find I agree them, with that. Yeah. you know. Um, uh, you do find people who are like very mad at me. I, don't get me wrong, and certainly mad at you. And um, what do you mean? It's certainly mad at you. As if they're more reasonable to be mad at me than at you, they should be equally mad at the two of us. I believe. Uh, it, I didn't say reasonable. It's it's more understandable that they're mad at you. you I understand. You, you've you've uh, just, you know. I just lack that charm, the kind of grace that you have to disarm your enemies. I suppose it's... that's it. Uh, I would just say, look, there are a lot of different frequencies of never Trumperism. <laughs> I'm, I'm, and, um, <laughs> I'm one frequency over from you, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I'm one or two frequencies short of, you know, Pete Wainer and Brett Stevens. That's and right. So, and, you know, and, so. and you seem, you, you sound like Mike Pence saluting Donald Trump's broad shouldered leadership next to Jen Rubin. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, there are, there are gradations here. Yeah, the varieties of never Trumpism. That'll be a very, that'll be a book or an article that will have a readership of 12. Yeah, no, we'll yeah. all be but very interested in it. It would be, be a very high level readership. Um, and uh, I can't even remember where, where we were going, going with this. The rationalization thing. Oh, so though, the rationalization yeah. thing. Um, People are not actually Kool-Aid drinkers most. Well, most, most aren't. They want them to succeed. Um, but you, one of the reasons why I think social media and, and cable are worse than reality is uh, that they don't want nuance. And the people who are most invested in defending their position um, are the most likely to be talk radio hosts, cable news hosts, um, uh, and sort of social media pundit types, and which none of those places lend themselves to a nuanced position. And uh, you know, one of the lessons I learned very early as a columnist, and I don't know, I don't, you know look, Ann Coulter makes a lot more money than I do. Lots of these people make a lot more. Sean Hannity flies private, but likes to refer to the Jonah Goldberg class as if I'm the elitist. Um, but uh, <laughs> does he really do this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was, he, was, he, he did he. I don't know, about a year Those ago. Those of us who know you were amused by the idea of you were having a, the class, your own yes, class yes, of and jets and, uh, <laughs> you know, high high life at, the, he, Goldberg, at he, the Goldberg rep mansion there. Every every three or four months, Sean goes nuts talking about how, trying to, like, demonize National Review cruises as the height of luxury. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and National Review cruises are lovely. I'm sure the Weekly Standard cruises are lovely. But, uh, you know, Sean is worth, I don't know, $25, $50 yeah. million. Dollars. So I just, it's tartuffery as far as I'm concerned. And if Sean's watching, he can go look up what that word means. Right. Anyway, um, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that it's been, again, we got distracted here. The reality is, is that um, the people who are most invested in making this a black and white thing are the ones with the megaphones. Right. And, um, and I think that's a real problem because it there is sort of very little social space to say Donald Trump has actually been pretty good. And this is so we, we started this thing by wanting to talk about our predictions and where we were a year ago. Um, from a conservative perspective, I have to say, taking his character out of it, right? Just as a as the chief executive, as the head of the party, all of that. Um, forgetting the branding, the damage he's done to the Republican brand, brand among millennials and all of the rest. It's actually gone much better than I feared. Hmm. Um, first of all, his judicial appointments have been great, right? I mean, I, 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 I don't know that there's a candidate that we would have supported more than Donald Trump, which was pretty much all of them, right? With me, the possible exception of George Pataki. But um, who I think is like a case of bad clams. He just keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so the judicial appointments have been great. The 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 marketing of his repealing of a lot of the Obama stuff has been ugly, but on policy grounds, it's pretty good. What I feared, and what a lot of people feared, I mean, we probably talked about it at the time, is um, that Trump was going to come out of the gate and be the New York liberal that he had been, right. cut a massive, co-opt Democrats in a massive way, and um, uh, and instead he listened to Steve Bannon and the sort of as I, you know, somewhat unfairly like to say, and he gave that 
inaugural, which sounded better in the original German, <laughs> and um, or maybe not German, you know, Italian. You know, yeah, it, it did sound Italian. like you know, Italian, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that at the end of it, you know, he was going to shout, "And Trieste will belong to Italy forever." <laughs> um, but uh, uh, and he immediately alienated Democrats even more, right? And if he had not, it, I actually thought he wouldn't do that. Would, right. Wasn't going to do that. And if he had done something like a giant infrastructure thing. He doesn't care about budgeting the budget or any of that kind of stuff. Um, he would have brought along, what, half, two thirds of the Republican Party. He would have broken the spine of the Tea Party crowd forever. Um, either they would have lost their political clout or they would have gone along with it and either one would have been fatal. And he conceivably could have gotten a significant chunk of Democrats to go along. And even if it failed, he would have opened his presidency with a legislative agenda that would be very popular with rank and file Democrats, very popular with the, his base who got him elected, um, and would have marginalized all sorts of voices like us even more than we have been. And, um, but he didn't do that. Instead, he went for this blood of patriots nonsense. And um, I think it was a colossal mistake, but I'm glad he made it. Yeah. And, uh, and the dysfunction in Congress Donald Trump certainly deserves his share of blame of, but it's not all his fault, right? right. I mean, the GOP is a mess, and it's really divided into these different constituencies. But, uh, you know, what is the old Soviet joke about how um, things couldn't get any worse? The pessimist says things couldn't get any worse, and the optimist says, oh, of course they can get worse. Yeah, right, <laughs> um, right. It could have been worse, yeah. you know? No, I think, that's a, I, mean, I think that's an important point. That from a, I mean, he wasn't Buchanan in the sense that he or even Bannon, in the yeah. sense that he really was willing to, in a determined and systematic way, carry out a campaign to transform American conservatism or America right. in a real nationalist, populist, et cetera, direction. He wasn't Nixon, if you want to think maybe that's the right analogy, on the, of, of let's co-opt the Democrats right. uh, and, you know, in an Israeli-like way, have a clever way of splitting the Democrats. And he was party. surrounded by Nixonites. Yeah, right? I mean, and like, he really, sh in a way, that I kind of thought that's what he might do. Yeah. Instead, he just sort of went very partisan, I mean, it is a weird thing, the combination of extreme partisanship without any real content to it. It's not as if right. he believes in whatever Republican, limiting government, uh, worrying about the deficit. Uh, it's all lizard brain stuff, right? It's all, I mean, to the extent he's a partisan, he's a partisan because... He ran against Hillary. He ran against Hillary <laughs> right. and because Democrats are attacking him more mean-spiritedly than Republicans are, right? right. But it, he doesn't care about the party. Right. And he, he lets that slip all the time. But so you think conservatism in that respect has slightly escaped some damage that Trump could have done. I mean, let's let's talk about conservatism. Yeah, Where does I mean, conservatism stand a year, a year in? You know, we're uh, 2015. I think most of us were pretty optimistic. An excellent class of young senators, congressmen, governors. We had Tom Cotton and Ben Sass and Nikki Haley and Ted Cruz yeah. and Marco Rubio, and they all you know had their own angles and limitations. But that's not bad, really. No, it was great. Greater diversity yeah. and not not in a stupid liberal way, but in a genuine way in yeah. terms of backgrounds and uh, people from winning in the Midwest, winning in the South. And then suddenly, you know, where are we two years later? I mean, how worried are you? How much is the whole conservative? Are we at the end of an era? Is it a hiccup? What's what? What do you what do you make of it? So it's interesting. I'm. I'm this is something you've thought about a ton. I mean, yeah, you've written I, about so much. I, I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, <coughs> I'm working on a piece for the Mac, for National Review about um, about some of this, and I haven't I haven't written a word of it yet. And by, by the time this comes out, maybe I'll. Have, put it out. Um, but <coughs> um, I've been rereading the early debates about, um, you know, conservatism, gen like people don't understand conservatism is, is, is in many respects the most recent ideology in American political right. history, right? It's the youngest one. Um, classical liberalism and the, or the strain that we call classical liberalism of libertarianism goes back, way back, you know. Um, uh, past Herbert Spencer into sort of, you know, anarchist theory. You can find Roman antecedents of it. I don't know if you want to say cynicism was a kind of libertarianism. You can. Um, um, progressivism, been around for a long time. Socialism, been around for a long time, much longer than Marx. Um, but in the 1940s and 1950s, a bunch of people um, were part of this conversation about which essentially created conservatism, right? And Russell Kirk create, create, writes The Conservative Mind, which was vilified by lots of establishment liberal people saying this is a hodgepodge of an intellectual history. You can't find an actual conservative tradition in America. 
Um, uh, your dad was part of this conversation. Uh, um, you know, National Review basically forges this weird synthesis around fusionism, which philosophically is really flawed, but as an organizing principle is fantastic. And, um, but what's sort of fascinating is, is in 19, it, right during and right after the McCarthy moment, there's this huge debate on the right, um, such as it was, about populism. And they actually called it nationalism for the lar large part. And um, the McCarthyites, according to Will Herberg and Willie Schlamm and these guys, um, were the nationalists. Hmm. And they use that term. They use that term, which I, you know, I must have read the George Nash book three times, uh, cover to cover, and I, n I never remembered this discussion in it. And but now it feels so unbelievably relevant to the moment. Um, and they call them nationalists in a pejorative way, largely in a pejorative way. Right. And they also didn't like the liberals, which like Herberg and Schlamm would always capitalize and put in quotation marks, um, because they didn't back then. It was still a fairly new thing to call progressives liberals, right? It's FDR who starts that in the 30s. Um, and as late as 1952, McCarthy himself was calling himself a liberal. I mean, so, yeah. And, with a small L. With a small L. And also, but McCarth McCarthy, McCarthy... McCarthy attacks liberals with a capital L, I think, yeah. in the founding document of National Review. That's and, right. Yeah, yeah. And, but people also forget that McCarthy actually comes out of more of the progressive Republican wing right. of the Wisconsin party, which was essentially, it wasn't Bolshevik, but it was pretty left wing. And, um, but anyway, uh, and so it's, this, Will Herberg writes this piece for the new leader in 1954 called, um, I think, Government by Rabble Rousing. And he makes this argument, which I think is unbelievably resonant for today, where he says, uh, the founding fathers were as afraid of despotism as they were of direct democracy because they were close students of history and they understood that direct democracy leads to despotism, yeah. right? And he says the, the demagogues um, uh, of ancient Greece and ancient Rome um, manipulated the crowd. And uh, he even says, you know, the, he says, you know, Caesar and, and Pericles, they use the arena and the forum to to rabble rouse and to exert their will on the elites. And the founding fathers were terrified of that and they wanted deliberative democracy, which was largely closed off. It was dem democratic in that these were the legitimate representatives of the people. But then once behind closed doors, they could slowly and methodically think things through. And, and so Herberg says, uh, this, there've always been rabble rousers in the past, but there was no means of really doing it well um, technologically until radio comes along. Hmm. And it's FDR who is the first rabble rouser. Hmm. And he says, look, FDR was a public spirited man. He's a good man. He's more pro FDR than I am. Um, but his fireside chats were used to launch these incredible public pressure campaigns against Congress, write letters, make phone calls, send telegrams, force Congress to exert my will, right? And then McCarthy comes along, and he then there's did, uh, there's other rap arousing on the radio, presumably from the right, right or yeah. from people who are on the left to become like Father right. Coughlin Father Coughlin is one of these guys. He's a classic sort of demagogue, although he was a huge FDR supporter. Um, he and when he broke with FDR, this is one of my great intellectual, you know, grievances is the, the consistent calling of Father Coughlin a right winger. Um, when he broke with FDR, he broke with FDR from the left. Right. He said that FDR is, the New Deal didn't go nearly far enough, um, but. Uh, then McCarthy comes along, and he is the same sort of rabble rouser. He has no serious ideas about how to do anything. He just has the right enemies. He rouses passions, and um, and so and then he, and then Herbert says, you know, TV is making these things worse. And the Kiff Hauer hearings were basically TV shows, and it's amazing how resonant, given like what we were talking about earlier about yeah, yeah, watching yeah. politics as TV. Yeah. He saw this more than a half century ago, as seeing how mass entertainment technology is turning poli is, is, is siphoning off the deliberative aspects of, of politics and making it into um, a kind of rabble rousing and entertainment. And, um, and so anyway, it's a bit of a discursion, but my point is, is, is that- Is there a pushback against him? Are there people who say, oh, that's just your elevated sensibilities and things are fine? Well, and, you know- I mean, And of course, Buckley himself is a semi-defender of McCarthy. I mean, Buckley and Bozell were defenders of McCarthy. And it will, so anyway, that, that gets me, that's the question because it gets me back to the point I was, you were asking about. Um, um, the conservative movement back then in its embryonic form was trying to create a 
alternative to sort of the East Coast establishment, right, and um, and the liberal establishment, which were sort of the same thing. And so people like Kirk, Whitaker Chambers, Schlamm, um, Herberg, they um, they were sympathetic with the broader arguments of McCarthy, right? Um, uh, but they didn't like his rabble-rousing aesthetic and um, and personality, and uh, and so Burnham, Kirk, all of these guys, they refused to say they were pro or anti McCarthy because they thought both his enemies and his supporters were wrong. Buckley and Bozell try to thread the needle, and I think that that this raises sort of and as your dad, you know, has that famous line where he said um, about the American people. Um, know one thing about Joseph McCarthy, he's, he's, he's an anti-communist about his critics, they can't be too sure. I'm right, about right? liberals, they know no such thing or something. Right, you know I mean? and, um, and so this, 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 this tension of agreeing with the populists in sort of emotionally, but intellectually thinking that they're just a little too worked up and a little too simple about how they make their arguments, has been baked into conservatism from the very beginning. And it comes up again in the 1960s with the Wallace stuff. Um, you know, I was just, was just reading the other day Barry Goldwater's, you know, take on Wallace, and it sounds like he's talking about Donald Trump. Is there? And how, so this is what, this is 68? Yeah, mean, Wallace, 68, yeah. And how, t and so what is his take? I mean, well, he, he eventually he gets, I was Sounds like a very interesting article, you should write it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a book, you write another book, you know. Uh, no more books. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> He ends up making it a point about not throwing away your vote on a third party. But the beginning is all about how, um, you know, Wallace certainly has identified many of the problems. He does, he, you know, like the, what he calls the intellectual morons of academia who are, uh, you know, who think we're all stupid and, and, and think this country is bad and run down. And he might have been talking about people taking the knee at football games. It was that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And so Wallace is on the right side of these things, and and but he's crude, and he's you know vaguely implies that he's bigoted. You know, sixty eight was a weird time for National Review, and for Goldwater. But um, uh, you're reading it like it sounds like he's talking about Trump, right? And he's like, yeah, emotionally he's on the right side of a bunch of stuff, um, but he's an irresponsible demagogue, and. Uh, and this tension runs through the contract with America. It runs right. through the Tea Party Tea stuff. Party. And it has been baked into a cake for a very long time. The problem is, and this gets back to the, the Herberg and the mass media stuff, is that the institutions of the right, places like National Review and the Weekly Standard and um, the various think tanks, um, they no longer have the, the technological ability to be the kind of gatekeepers they were um, 50 years ago. And the internet lets a thousand flowers bloom. Um, it rewards the most extreme statements rather than the most reasonable statements or the most persuasive statements. And, uh, and so this, well, this, this fight between the, the sort of Kirkian, way too elitist by my lights, um, uh, conservative intellectual stuff and the mass populism thing has always been going on. The technological changes have all gone in favor of the populists. Um, it just makes it easier to elect, you know, uh, people who, and the gerrymandering and that stuff helps it too, but there's sort of the structural changes in the economy, in technology, and in communication are much more on the populist side. And not just on the right, on the left too. And, um, and that's why I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this before we get it out of our system, if we do. Yeah, I guess, what, I mean, one, I don't know if this is really a caveat, but one other way to maybe think about this is, it seems to me that it's a Tea Party, to take the most recent example. And we were both pretty pro Tea Party. I was pro Tea Party. It was the only populist movement I ever supported. And I won't say I regret it because it seems to me directionally the Tea Party sentiments were pretty correct and pretty healthy, really. Mm -hmm. Debt is a huge problem. Big, we want li limited government. Back Le to basics, co constitution. Yeah, yeah. Right, education. Well, maybe they were a little crazy to be so obsessed with the Common Core, but the instinct that, you know, can we right. just have local control of the schools and back to basics education? So a lot of that. Um, Palin, who was a precursor of that in 08, was a McCain Republican. I mean, she was stylistically right. populist, but her actual views on things right. were not. And there, Trump, I think, is different. That's what Trump is both more populist and more demagogic than the previous sort of populist and right. sort of demagogic things, but but also just is not 
in any way in favor of limited government or American leadership in the world or stuff that was pretty Tea Party. The Tea Party had elements mm-hmm. already of a little bit of, na- of some nativism, I'd say, on the immigration issue, probably a little protectionism. Though that wasn't a big part. I don't recall the Tea Party message. A little bit of Fortress America, maybe. You know, let's win the wars we fight, but mostly right. support for American sure, sure, sure. It's leadership very in the world, right. patriotic. Right. So Trump has sort of taken it to another level or in a slightly different direction, it seems to me, in that respect. I mean, that, that maybe it was always int- there was always that potential there, I guess one would have to yeah. say. But maybe it's what you're saying. It gets unmoored from any kind of... Palin had the sense that she should defer to John McCain on big policy issues because John McCain had been... Right. Was the Republican nominee, so it's an odd situation. She's the VP nominee. But also, McCain had been a senator for 25 years. He knew what he was talking about. And, you know, our point was to get rid of liberal idiocy, um, their point was, but um, not to sort of really question the fundamental Bush-McCain views of the world. Right, right. I think what Trump does is take it to another level of real questioning of even the conser- of the conservative elite views. Yeah, so, so I have a slightly different take on this, and I get into this in this forthcoming book, but I'll do a little bit of it here. Um, uh, my publisher's going to be furious. No, me. no, this but, is always good pre-publicity, yeah. you know. The, um, can it, you know it's, it's. So I think, look, I, I agree with you about the Tea Parties. I was a pro-Tea Party guy. I spoke at Tea Party rallies, and I did Tea Party events, um, in part because the history of populism is generally the history of expanding government, wanting more from government. Right. It's grievance politics. It's identity politics. And... The Tea Party seemed to be raping, breaking with that. You know, they, um, it was all about the Constitution. It was all about back to basics. People were reading Hayek and, and Tea right. Party reading groups. It was great, right? It, all, it almost seemed like it was going to fulfill the great ancient libertarian prophecy of, you know, of libertarians taking over the government and leaving everybody alone, right? right. And, um, but here's the problem. The way they were treated, and yeah, there were some yahoos and weirdos. Any mass energetic movement is going to invi- invite a few crackpots, but on the whole, it was an incredibly healthy thing. It was the kind of response you would hope for when the country has gone off the rails, right? Let's get back to basics. Let's get back to the American idea. And they were still called racists right. and fascists. They were still demonized and lied about. And um, um, and it was sort of fascinating. We talk about rationalizations in psychology. Um, it was so overlooked that, that the favorite tea, leaders of the Tea Party um, faction were often African Americans, right. and it was. I always thought that was in part because these are we were these were basically decent people, and they were trying to demonstrate that this is not a racial argument. The Constitution is not a white document, right? And so they supported Herman Cain, and then they supported Ben Carson um, because they they wanted to say, look, we don't like Obama because of his ideas, um, not because he's black, and we don't like being called racist. That was the essence of of. Andrew Breitbart's entire worldview was he was outraged at being called a racist. Mm. And um, and so then what happened, so but then the Tea Parties are dismissed, they're ridiculed, um, and they also attract a whole bunch of cynical jackasses who become, you know, corrupt, money-bilking, uh, you know, uh, grifters. Um, and I think it caused something of a psychic break. And if you go and you look at the arguments that people like Michael Anton made, right? Um, and I had several arguments with him in print about this. This is the Flight 93 yeah, author. This, right? this is the Flight 93 guy who's now on the National Security Council. Um, and uh, he basically argued, and lots of other people have argued, that the old America is already gone. And we are now in an era of tribal identity politics. And therefore, um, as I think he told Andrew Sullivan in the, for the New York Magazine, if we're going to have a Caesar anyway, wouldn't you rather have our Caesar? And do you think the, the Obama re-election in 2012 was a key moment there where people just thought, oh, my God, we've lost, you know, oh, wait, you can understand, first right. African-American president, financial crisis, whatever, McCain, flawed. But 12 was like, how could that happen? Yeah, no, I think it was an unfolding process, yeah. right? And so you, had, you have an enormous number of people who, of the sort of early adopters of Trump, who basically think, well, we're going to get called racist anyway. Um, let's just do what our tribe wants, right? And it's this erosion of... And a demagogue who's not scared to play the race card doesn't put you off people, right? as George Wallace right. did put off Barry Goldwater. And, you know. and the, 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 the funny thing, or not, it's not funny, but um, if you look at some of the social science data on this, 
like, like I'm I'm a last I checked a white person, right? But I never like taken any great meaning from being white. I, I suspect it's probably the same for you. Yeah. It's the same for almost, I mean, like literally almost all of the white people I've ever known. Right. But it turns out that the more you call people, first of all, the more you demonize whites as, you know, white privilege, white supremacy, the, the permanence of race, the whole Todd Nahisi Coates argument, um, the more, the natural reaction from white people who cannot change their skin, unless you're Elizabeth Dolezal, is um, to say, wait a second, you know, you know, my parents weren't evil people. I'm not an evil person. There's some white people who did some okay things in the history of this country. I'm proud of my country. And you start embracing a racial identity that you didn't have before. And um, the data is pretty clear on this, is that the more you consider yourself that part of your self-identity was as a white person, the more likely you were to vote for Trump. And the people who are feeding a lot of these problems are the left by telling everybody you have to think of your t yourself in terms of your skin color. And um, that is another one of these sort of Orwellian, you can be a failure, take the drink, become more of a failure because you drink thing. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I guess one way of saying it would be the populist reaction to a left of 2013 is gonna be worse, more toxic in a way, than the populist reaction to capital L liberalism of 1952. Because capital L liberalism of 1952, though we don't, like it, and right. we would have been with Buckley attacking it, and so forth, um, and showing its at least, or at least understanding its weaknesses and limitations, and all oh, was. I mean, you read God and Man at Yale. I guess it was Buckley's first book, right? Yeah. And you know he's, what he's complaining about. It's like really. I mean, compared to today, no, exactly. yeah, he's yeah, complaining yeah. about a Yale that we would give anything to have back. Yeah, old-fashioned, liberal, slightly right. obtuse, maybe. You know, professors who basically believe in kind of liberal pieties like free speech. You know, right. and, 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 and you know progress in an old-fashioned sense, scholarship. We're, you know, we're pro Keynes. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Oh. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. If only. I mean, so I guess that's an interesting point. It's not. The, it's not the excuse anyone's behavior in, yeah, it's an analytical in real point. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but in the real world, the universities we have, the political correctness we have, leads to Trump. Yeah, but, Not, but, you know, or, or muta and, and at least the mutation, I would say. The, tea, the mutation of the Tea Party into Trump is an underreported phenomenon that I find, it's very distressing. I yeah, mean, it, I it does make you then wonder, well, how much of that was in the Tea Party from the first? Maybe there's stuff I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see some nativism. I didn't want to see some prejudice. And that's probably some truth to that, of course. Yeah, so, no, I think that's right. But, um, um, but, you know, when we did this a year ago, we were talking about how one of the main justifications for Trump was at least he's not politically, not, at least he's not politically correct. And I've always thought that was a garbage argument because he's politically correct when it's useful for him and he's right. politically incorrect when it's useful for him. Um, he's the nearest weapon to hand kind of guy. But, um, but political correctness is, it's a complicated subject, but for millions upon millions of Americans, it feels like they're just slowly draining all the meaning from the, from the traditional civilization that we grew up in or they grew up in, and replacing it with this thing where they have to defer to pointy-headed people they don't like right. who tell them that they're evil because of the color of their skin. And you could see how that would build the kind of resentment and populist backlash that would make someone like Donald Trump possible. And I guess there is a vicious cycle then because Trump appears and the universities go even more crazy. That's course. right. He and reinforces their, the worst and part. And some of their complaints are right, and we agree yeah. with them. Trump shouldn't threaten the First Amendment and so forth. He shouldn't demagogue, you know, all these right. things. But then they justifies. It seems like it justifies the left in going crazier, and that is, I suppose, a, that's a pessimistic scenario for the country. I yeah, mean, it's a, it's a center does not hold problem, right? right you know, right. it's sort of like, um, and this is what Bannon's whole vision is, right? And I, is um, he calls himself a Leninist? I think that's grandiose, but he does believe in the worse the better, and he says it. You know, he says we need a war. This is a war, and um, and it reminds me of like, remember. During the Obama administration, every every now and then, some idiot wanted to burn the Koran, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, I'm against burning the Koran on simple, prudential, good manners reasons. It's right. just I, I'm against burning books, right? And yeah, right. certainly against burning holy books. Right. But uh, you got this sort of dynamic, this catalytic dynamic, where people were like, "We don't, we can't let the Muslims have a heckler's veto about what we do." And so we have to support this guy for burying the Quran. And then you had other people saying, no, we have to ban it entirely. And what happens is you're people 
normal people, rational people, the left and the right, who want to take the middle ground position, which is that the guy shouldn't burn the Koran, but yes, he ultimately he has a right to do it. Um, uh, you just you have no audience, right? Because it's either ban it completely or applaud as he burns the Koran. And I think that sort of dynamic is running straight through our culture about a million things. People who want to say, yeah, Trump is right about this, but he's, or, or his advisors who are steering Trump in this direction is right about this, um, but he's a demagogue and he's ill-suited to the office. Um, you get condemned at, from the, the resistance as being too um, politically expedient and you get condemned from the right, such as it is, um, as being um, uh, insufficiently supportive of our commander in chief, right? And you find this in the culture war arguments, like the, the stupid kneeling football thing, right? On the substance, I'm entirely with Donald Trump uh, to the extent that uh, as long as you're not actually compelling anybody, these guys shouldn't be taking the knee during the Pledge of Allegiance. It's rude, it's dumb, it's a bad business decision. But yeah, they have a right to do it. Um, and it's not worth having a heart attack about it. Right? It's not worth having a heart attack about it, and it's not worth politicizing this sport, which is supposed to be one of the safe havens from politics. And this sort of gets us back to the beginning about the problem of politicizing lifestyle is that um, there are fewer and fewer safe harbors from politics. And that's happening to religion, it's happening to entertainment, it's happening to the Boy Scouts, it's happening to all the little platoons of civil society. And the problem is, is that when you politicize these little things, you essentially destroy them. And, um, and you create the centrifugal forces for mass rabble rousing because people look to Washington then to give them that sense of belonging that they should be getting much closer to home. So are we the party of the center must be strengthened so the center can hold again? Or are we the party of conservatism, which was never center, you know, which was right. sort of con slightly contemptuous, honestly, of this, you know, the center must, you know, we all have to be get along with each other kind of it's centrism. A, I feel somewhat torn myself in this in I, I do too. I mean, my <laughs> last book, The Tyranny of Clichés, you know, which I admit is a terrible title, but a uh, big chunk of that was all about mocking no labels and right. centrism right. And, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I still stand by all those arguments, but um, it's almost like the, 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 the center that we're talking about is a different center. Yeah, it's not. It's not a, a deeper center, maybe. It's yeah, a, it's, it's liberal it's, democracy. You know, it's more like I mean, the vital center that Schlesinger talked about was more of a foreign policy concept than a domestic thing. It gets misunderstood a lot, but it's sort of that idea of that there's there should be this realm of civic life where deliberative democracy is possible, right? Where arguments are possible, and um, and that's a conservative position, right? The, the, you know, defending the American founding and the architectural, the, the constitutional architecture of our country is in a way defending the center because it's saying there needs to be this place in American politics where the better arguments can win. And right now, so little of our politics is about better arguments. It's all about, you know, as Donald Trump would put it, fighting and winning, which are completely amoral concepts. Yeah, that's, so that's good. I'm going to steal this. That's, so that's, in a way, defending the, the center properly understood today is, is a conservative task and is what conservatism was always about to some degree against progressivism. Right. Which had a certain contempt for this kind of, you know, old-fashioned uh, institutions of constitutional democracy, of right. deliberation. Woodrow Wilson hated the society, Constitution and all that stuff, right? right? Limited government. Right. So, was the vital center, incidentally? I, I've got to go look at that now. That was more foreign policy? Well, if I remember right, I don't want to get in trouble on this, no, um, so okay, I'm open to correction, it. but I could swear that what Schlesinger really meant by the vital center was, was that the world at the time was, as he saw it, sort of divided between communism and fascism. And that, and, and remember, there were, right after World War II, there were very few liberal democracies around, yeah. right? And so he saw liberal democracy as, the vital as this vital center. And probably domestically, things. it's sort of liberal anti-communism as the vital center between Right. This up, but I would suspect between fellow travelers on the one hand, Henry Wallace on the one hand, and Joe McCarthy on the other. Right. So there was a domestic analog with his founding of the ADA and all that stuff, and right. trying to kick out the Wallace progressives and and. Uh, so we need to go back to that. That's interesting. I mean, so you cited. Actually, I've got to go back and look at these things myself. I mean, they. It sounds like you've actually think. 
going back and reading stuff from the 40s, 50s, 60s turns out to be quite helpful. I mean, oh, I think, it's, I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I love Which is reassuring to me because I think people, it would be bad if we discovered that there was nothing to be learned from these yeah. thinkers we look up to and who were a generation or two before us or even before our parents. And, and uh, I'm sort of reassured that you found them <laughs> worth going back to look at. Well, but one of the questions one asks is, are we just in a new yeah. world? Technology, globalization, social media, traditional conservatism seems dead, traditional liberalism died a while ago, and you know, those were all wonderful, they're interesting, the way we read about debates in the 17th and 17th century Great Britain, they're very intelligent people, but there's something to be learned at a very abstract level about yeah. politics and society, but really, I mean, you don't read some 17th century debate and think, you know, well, that's really, you know, resonates, but it sounds like you do think that in that respect, the American conservative tradition, the authors who were who were key to it in the early years, some of the authors who were part maybe of the liberal tradition as well, there really are things to be learned. Yeah, so, I mean, again, this, again, I've been like Howard Hughes with Kleenex boxes on my feet for the last couple of years working on this book, and so I've, I've got strong views about some of this stuff. Um, it seems to me one of the central cons insights of conservatism is the idea that human nature has no history, right? That um, as, a line I actually learned from your dad, I can never find where Hannah Arendt actually said this, <laughs> but your dad quoted Hannah Arendt saying this all the time, which is that every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children, right? right? And the central conservative insight is, is that uh, civilization is something that you have to start over with every human being, right? And, um, and so that, I think that's a really important thing to understand in terms of looking back at old debates. I honestly think, and this is a major theme of the book I wrote, but I honestly think there really are no new arguments um, since uh, the sort of what I call the Lockean Revolution, right? I mean, this was the one big new thing in a really, really long time. The last similarly big new thing was the birth of Christianity. And, um, uh, and, so if what, what is true is that human nature has no history and that human nature cannot be, one of the other conservative insights is that you can't get rid of human nature, right? The whole uh, opposition to the French side of the Enlightenment is uh, rejection of the Rousseauian idea of the perfectibility of mankind, right? You cannot get back to the noble savage because the noble savage never existed. And, and no utopianism, no, right. no, no new Soviet man, and all that. Right. And we like the founder, hard-headed. Right, because the hard-headed Lockean liberalism. Again, right. as your dad, I mean, for mm -hmm. viewers who don't know, mm -hmm. Bill's dad was a huge influence on me. Um, but in his American Revolution as a successful revolution, he talks about how the reason why the American Revolution was successful is because it took human nature into account rather than trying to write it out of um, the political project that they were doing. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why, and I think I might have talked about this last time we were here, why I think science fiction is such useful literature because the whole reason why science fiction or fantasy, right, Game of Thrones, whatever, works is that you can change all of the material circumstances, all the technological circumstances around people, and the one constant that makes it accessible is that people can relate to other human beings and human nature because human nature does not change. Now, we may technologically one day start changing human nature, but I don't think so. And so when you go back and you look at these debates, like this Will Holberg thing with the radio, right, what you're really seeing is um, the same patterns of human nature expressing itself given the, the context of the times. Um, and this whole fight about like nationalism that we have today, this is a very old fight in American history. I mean, you know the founding stuff better than I do, but um, you know, in the 19th century, there was, in the early 20th century, there were these things called the Bellamy Clubs or the Nationalist Clubs, which came out in response to a a science fiction book called Looking um, Backward that was written mm -hmm. in the year 2000. And written in the 1900, about, uh, yeah, it was, it was about a, the year 2000. It was a right. utopian. Dystopia or right. utopia? Or dystopia? It was more utopia. It was yeah. sort of a technological yeah. utopianism. Yeah. And um, the, one of the great things in the book is it's, it's, it's all about, you know, all of these 19th century forms of, uh, from H.G. Wells and Bellamy and all these people, they all um, are just sure that in the future we're going to be collectivist, right? Because that's what good things are, is collectivist. And so one of the great metaphors in the book is there's this narrator describing how things have changed over the last century. And he says, you know, it used to be that when it rained, 
people carried their own umbrellas. Think about how inefficient that is. Mm -hmm. Now today, whenever it rains, giant canopies come out from on top of buildings and cover all of us so that we're all in it together. You know, and it's that kind of vision of stuff. But these nationalist clubs were huge in the United States and a huge part of American politics. And this whole, you know, the Birchers, McCarthy, the Wallace thing, all of these things were replete with the, the, this, these contradictions between nationalism and patriotism. The stuff that Seymour Martin Lipset wrote was all about whether or not, you know, um, Americanism was a creedal ideological position right. or whether or not it was not and like we were more like Europe. And he obviously took, you know, our side on this. Um, and American exceptionalism, a term that I think he, I don't know if he coined, but he wrote about as yeah. a social scientist. Right. Now it's become a political slogan. But that was really explaining why America didn't go down the path of Europe, right. certainly to fascism. Implicitly, I, but I mean, certainly to socialism, but also to fascism, as I vaguely right. recall. No, right? I mean, absolutely. that was sort of yeah. the argument that we were different for various reasons, middle class, I mean, various sociological yeah, and he reasons. Didn't, and he wasn't necessarily saying it was all good. No, it was just sort of it was explaining an why thing. don't we have a labor party? Why don't we have a social democratic right. party? Why didn't we have a national I mean, socialist I, workers party? Right? I think I mean, that discipline starts actually with um, Werner Sombart, the guy who asked, why is there no socialism in America? Right. And his answer was, we didn't have a feudal past, right? right. And so, and, so, but Marty picked up on that, and um, I, uh, I was a big fan of Marty Lipsis. I read a lot of his stuff in my early days in Washington, and I saw him every now and then because he was around the American Enterprise Institute a bit. And I've stolen from him. I always give him credit, but in speeches, I bring this up all the time, and now I'm ruining it because now all of America will see it. Um, but uh, he used to explain American exceptionalism, and he had this great sort of take on it where he would say, you know, conservatives – like to talk about back then West Germany, East Germany were still a thing, or at least fresh in people's minds, or North Korea and South Korea as these natural experiments between capitalism and socialism and all that. And he says, that's all fine. But a much more interesting one, an understudied one, um, is actually in North America. Because at the time of the founding, if you were, for, uh, if you were British, right, um, and you were in favor of the revolution, um, and the principles of a revolution, you either moved to the 13 colonies or you stayed there. If you were a loyalist or a royalist, you were, you, large numbers of you either left the 13 colonies and moved up to Canada or you stayed there. Same genetic population, same cultural population, mm -hmm. same institutions in every way. It's the greatest, one of the greatest natural experiments in political science ever. And then he says, you know, so you fast forward 200 years in the 1970s, Canada and the United States at the same time told their people we're switching to the metric system. And the Canadians, because they have a rich political tradition of being lick spittles to mm -hmm. the throne, um, were like, okay. You know, mm -hmm. and so now up there it's all kilometers and centimeters mm -hmm. and other witchcraft. And in America, they're like, Are you, are you freaking kidding me? We're not gonna do that, yeah, you right. know? And and he says, This is an example of American exceptionalism. It's, it's neither good nor bad. You can make a really strong argument that it's stupid for America. Right. Not to switch to the metric system, but it's just we do. Our violence, we're a much more violent culture than other countries. That was always considered part of his un ex explanation of American exceptionalism. He didn't like the violence, but now it's become this thing, this stupid football where Obama talks about it in a dumb way and then Trump talks about it in a dumb You know, Trump doesn't like American exceptionalism. exceptionalism yeah, either. that is interesting, right? Um, he Because he has this vision of all nations are just simply self interested. Right. Um, uh, you know, entities that ideology is secondary, principles are secondary to raw national self-interest. We have our killers and Putin has his killers. Exactly. I mean, yeah. No, no, I think that's a very important point. That, but that is what's so distressing if you like to, if you're willing to tolerate or even respect it, a, a kind of a conservative populism that was exceptionalist, that was patriotic, to see it go in Trump's direction is... Uh, I guess it teaches lessons about the character of populism, how easily it gets hijacked. That's how just, seductive it is. Yeah, politics itself, how one can't count on things. One sidebar in science fiction, I can't remember if we discussed this a year ago either, but if we did, so what people so can, be it. So be it. So I've never had a, I don't know why, a taste for science fiction particularly, but I, I'm now, maybe I should have, because so many people I respect uh, seem to le have learned a fair amount from it. And also seem to think, is it intrinsically sort of conservative or anti-utopian or anti-progressive? Well, I, I think it is. I mean, there, there's certainly plenty of utopian science fiction. And again, I haven't read much science fiction in the last 20 years just because I'm a slow reader and I have so much like work-related reading. Right. Um, but I was, a, I was a teenage 
science fiction geek and love Dune and all that stuff. Um, and I think they're, they're while well, H.G. Wells sort of pioneered the utopian and very fascist um, science fiction uh, tradition, uh, you know, H.G. Wells was actually the inspiration for the title of my first book, Liberal Fascism. It's his phrase. Um, and big chunks of his science. Used favorably for, by him. Yeah, he's, he, he was invited by the young liberals in England to go speak to a convention in 1932 to chart the way forward. And he says, I finally figured it out after 30 years um, how to describe my political point of view. And this is 32, so Hitler hadn't done that much bad stuff yet. And he says, I've decided to call it liberal fascism. Or he also says, enlightened Nazism. And, um, and people forget, H.G. Wells was a really important science fiction author, but he was hugely influential on the American social gospel movement, on American progressivism. When he visited FDR, it was like a papal visit. I mean, he was wow. one of the most important public intellectuals in the English language. But anyway, um, I think yeah, for the simple reason that literature doesn't work unless it reflects the human condition, right? Unless it mirrors in some way the trials and travails and drama of our lived experience. And, uh, and it, requires, it requires struggle, right, for literature to work. There has to be a reason why the arc moves, narrative arc moves forward. And you can't write compelling, I don't think you can write compelling fiction about a perfect world where everything's great, right? right? And so you, by having to acknowledge that people have diverse interests and that human nature is a real thing and it creates factions and problems, um, it is inherently small c conservative in that way. Where are you on the question? This is another thing I've been thinking about, so uh -huh. it's kind of a sidebar, but relevant. Um, is it possible to recapture the word liberal or desirable? I mean, that is so much of what we're f in favor of is a certain understanding. I wouldn't say liberalism. I think once it becomes an ism, it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. But now that the progressives have decided they don't, they're not liberals, I mean, we are for liberal education. We are for liberal democracy, basically. Right. We are for a liberal world order, you could even say, you know. Uh, if we're for a kind of emp American empire, which I myself would be okay with, it's a liberal empire. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. based on self-government and so forth. It's not you know, exploitative. But is the word liberal just lost? I mean, was it ever there, really? I yeah, mean, yeah. I, I, when Hayek has that essay, why I'm not a conservative, he wishes he could just be a classic, right. classic, call himself a liberal or a classical liberal, but then he sort of says, well, that's probably not doable. And as you say, Buckley and others use liberal with a capital L. Right. A, well, I mean, so uh, this is something that it, uh, I wish it were possible, and it may be possible. Um, it's worth pointing out because I. Love that essay by Hayek. He's not talking about American conservatives explicitly. Um, he's talking about Demeist and all these blood and soil guys right. in in Europe. Um, and he says, and it's because libertarians drive me crazy where they quote the title of that essay, but they never read the actual essay. Um, he's saying that America is the one place in the world where you can call yourself a conservative and be, still be a champion of liberty because you're conserving a liberal revolution in the in the essence of the American founding, and um, uh, let me put it this way: I would be really happy if we could do it. You're probably a better guy to figure out a strategy for how to do it. Um, I think the, in one way, the only way it would happen is if you got a really smart, thoughtful conservative president who insisted on calling himself a liberal. Okay. And even then it would, because that's how FDR did it, right? And FDR took the word liberal, which you know comes out of these enlightenment-based democratic revolutions in Spain and then spreads northward. Um, uh, he took the word liberal to give himself a new brand name because they'd done so much damage to the word progressive. Is that right? Yeah, so like, remember the 1920 election um, was this absolute drubbing of the Democrats, we'll see, right? Because, right. and you, so you get, you have to wait for the Republicans to come in to release all the political prisoners, including Eugene V. Debs, mm -hmm. um, stop the rationing, stop the propaganda industry, get, you know, stop relying on these goons called the American Protective League, um, stop the war socialism, and go to what uh, the Republicans called a return to normalcy, right? And that was like, we're, we have to get back to being normal Americans. And um, the war and, in particular, so damaged the label progressive that throughout the 20s, left progressive intellectuals were kind of searching around and then FDR comes along and basically 
partisanizes the word liberal, because liberal used to mean like liberal and liberal arts, or what liberal means in Europe to this day, which means sort of open society, right? Still in political science, we talk about illiberal regimes. Right. Um, we are both liberals in any grand sense yeah, of it, absolutely. right? Yeah. And, um, and the funny thing is, is that it took until what, the 1990s, for them to so destroy the word liberal right. that they, and, and because people's memories are short, they picked up the word progressive, which had gotten even worse in the 40s because remember the communists took the word right. progressive, right. right? And Wallace becomes the head of the progressive party and, and they were just useful idiots for the Soviet Union. Um, so obviously history shows that these words can migrate around, but how you would actually do it and whether it's worth the energy that yeah. would be required I don't know. Well, it would be worth. It might be worth the energy if conservative were irretrievable. So let's get back. That's right. Circle back to that. Yeah. How much trouble is conservatism in? I mean, do you think that can one say we are, you know, carrying forward what the work of Buckley and many, many, many others I had, had hit a couple of bumps in the road here, but basically that remains the path. That's yeah. the fundamental strain that we are moving forward. Or is it sort of a moment where people say that was a wonderful, impressive thing, a wonderful thing? where we're sort of at such a new moment, we, it, it doesn't have much to tell us, or, and there's not much to appeal to because Trump is, has yeah. so damaged it. I don't know. I mean, I truly, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, um, I sometimes feel like you know, there's that old joke about the guy who jumps off the top of a building and he passes a window on the 10th floor and, and the guy in the, in the, says from inside the building, how's it going? And the guy falling to his death says, so far, so good. Yeah. You know, um, I just don't know where this is going. Um, I think that uh, it really kind of depends. I mean, let's put it this way. Trump could do us an enormous favor or he could do us an incredible disservice. And when I say us, I mean conservatives of the sort of s standard school. Um, if he started vilifying conservatism, Right. It would um, help enormously sort of save the word conservatives for what it, it's supposed to mean. Um, but if the more he embraces it, the more it's associated with him. Um, there's this weird capriciousness. I mean, like, I always he hated no with association with it. That's the thing. He lives in New York City. He's 71 years yeah. old. So he's, a, he's not a peer of Bill, a contemporary Bill Buckley's, but he is there as a major figure in New York for what? 20, 30 years yeah, of Bill's yeah. adult life, and God knows everyone else who's slightly younger. He's nowhere, right? I mean, yeah. There are other businessmen who are not, they're businessmen, they're not intellectuals, they're not activists, but they support National Review, they right. go to dinner with Bill Buckley, they get to know someone like my father. I mean, one knows of many, many people like that, different levels of activity and interest. What's most amazing about Trump is zero interest. Yeah. Didn't even, and it wasn't even his world. It wasn't a world he even liked or cared about. If anything, it was the other world he was part of. Right. Or, right, he goes to the Clinton's wedding. He doesn't go to, I don't know, you know, whatever the equivalent would be on the right. <laughs> Not the Clinton's, the Clinton's come to his yeah, daughter's yeah. wedding, but the, he doesn't think to invite, I don't know, who the leading, yeah. you know, Republicans or conservatives at the time would be, right? It's really amazing that he... He's take, a creature of celebrity. I mean, that's... Yes. I, I, and, and, and this is a problem, and this is a problem that we have that journalists have, the people who are in the words business, the ideas business, the, you know, at a very high concept level, the pattern recognition business, right? That's what intellectuals do is they find long-term trends and they, you know, connect dots and they, they talk about the, the grander significance of individual events and all that. People on the left, people on the right, defenders, critics, everyone is trying to fit Donald Trump into some larger meta thesis about his agenda or American politics and all these kinds of things. And I, you know, I certainly believe I, we can do that, but you have to take into account that he is essentially a leaf on the wind, right? He is a Chinatown tic-tac-toe chicken who is not motivated by any grand ideological agenda with the exception of stuff like trade right, and take the oil. Right. There are a handful right. of things that he's believed for a very long time. But for the most part, it's pure lizard brain status, um, uh, glandular stuff. And he listens to the last person who talked to him. He's sed seduced by compliments. Um, when he made the deal with Chuck and Nancy, um, he did it on the fly. There was no forethought, you know. And that is, that, that is great violence to people, to 
people cognitively in our line of work <laughs> because right. we're we're all about trying to figure out what the real plan is and there is no plan with him there's all sorts of scheming with the people around him for good right. and for ill right. either to manage him towards good things or to exploit him in the bannon sense for this ridiculous nationalism stuff but there's but he is a page 6 guy from the new york post and a bold faced names guy and he doesn't think strategically about this stuff. He brags about how he just goes with his gut in the moment. Um, and, you know, there's this thing in economics and social science called, um, I think it's called winner's bias. And the basic, there's a great cartoon about it where it has a guy who is saying, um, people told me um, I should just give up. People told me I was a fool. People told me that I was wasting my time. But I didn't listen to any of them, and I just kept buying lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. And look at me now, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people are just outliers, and they right. think it's proof that they're geniuses, um, when in reality is they're just lucky. And you find this with stock pickers and all the rest. We elevate the people who just may be at the right tail, far right tail of the distribution of lucky people when it comes to guessing correctly. Right. Trump is far out all there on the right tail. And I'm not saying he's not doesn't have some talents and stuff, but so much of what has made him successful just simply doesn't translate well to politics and doesn't translate well to the way people like you and me think about the world. And I mean, we said earlier, in a way it makes him less dangerous that he's not Bannon, let's right. say. He doesn't have the uh, you know, determination and sort of uh, will to achieve something that leads him to plow through various restraints. He just hits them, he bounces off and turns his attention to something else. I suppose the flip side of it is there's something maybe more dangerous about him, just the kind of feckless, chaotic, recklessness, celebrity culture, reality TV. I mean, there is an organization, it's sort of like, do you want to have a CEO who's wrongheaded and determined and right. competent, or do you want to have a CEO who's just feckless and sort of foolish and, and either can do damage to an organization? Right. right. So I used to think he was Lonesome Rhodes, right, who's the main character from uh, Face in the Crowd, Eli Kazan's fantastic movie about populism in the media, um, who was this brilliant demagogue who exploited people's fears and all the rest and rose to great power. And um, I'm much more on the side of him being Chauncey Gardner now. Right. Um, he's, he's just, he's a Rorschach test for people. And the, the, the whole point of Rorschach tests is there's actually no real meaning on the page. You're trying to reveal what people want to project onto it. And in that sense, he is sort of in the Weber sense, a classically charismatic politician and that people impose meaning on him that he is not in fact bringing to the table. But I suppose the denigration of democratic processes, of norms, of standards, of civility. That's all bad. Is bad and, and in a way more so than by a more, you know, systematic, I mean, the yeah, chaos, right. the chaos can do that. I, mean, I always think of it, the foreign policy and analog is, you know, you, the two ways of getting into a horrible world war that does unbelievable amount of damage, World War II, which is Closer to us, we tend to think of much more Mussolini, Hitler, right. Stalin, et cetera, or World War One, which is no one Just remembers. A stupid war. Yeah, yeah. chaos. I yeah. mean, foolishness, recklessness, un, you know, things spiraling out of control. Yeah, I sort of think Trump's more the first, but World War One did a heck of a lot of damage it as made, well, we, and, 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 and made say, World War Two possible. Yeah, right, right, and that's the other question: How much does Trump make possible post-Trumpian things that are worse? I mean, that what? Do, what yeah, I, I think. And I, I've been writing and saying this for two years now. I think that one of the things that I think Democrats, and we should be clear, the left and the Democrats are in a hot well, mess Sanders. too. Let's right? talk about Sanders a minute. For me, it always comes back to 45% of Democrats voting for Sanders, 45% of Republicans voting for Trump. Yeah, That's so, not a sign of a country with 45% of the people who vote in the primaries, a lot of people, 30 million in this case, uh, voting either for Sanders or Trump. Really? In 2016? It's one thing if it happens in the middle of the Depression. You know? you know, no, I agree. And, 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 and maybe it's because my last name is Goldberg. When nationalism and socialism are coming together as the <laughs> consensus position, right. national socialism, I'm sort of out of here. But, um, uh, uh, well, so two points. One, just very quickly, I think by breaking the blood brain barrier between entertainment and politics, long term, it opens up. This might be much worse for the Democrats. Because I still think in the summer right. of 2016, George Clooney or Tom Hanks or Oprah could have strolled in and said, I'm running, and Hillary would have gone down to 5% or something because people didn't like her, right? right. Really charismatic people, celebrities, um, 
have pa- this gets back to the whole point the founders were afraid of is, is, is they have real power in a democracy in, in, a, in, a, in a and the more democracy you have the more power they have and and the more power and the more we see politics as entertainment the more power that they have and so I think long term the Democratic Party could just simply become a cargo cult to some Hollywood figures um, in terms of the Bernie Sanders stuff I think his popularity is a symptom of the exact same thing for the most part of Trump's personality is that civil society or popularity um, civil society is in really rough shape people are looking for meaning they're looking for something to belong to and um, they're looking to find it in politics and uh, so if you're of one sort of aesthetic bent you think Trump is a bore and you're more inclined to go with Sanders um, and if you're of another bent you think Sanders is a loon, and you're more inclined to go with Trump. But um, maybe it's because I worked on that book, Liberal Fascism, and I, I, I know the literature on how many brown shirts became red shirts and how many red shirts became brown shirts. And it was basically these atomized young men in uh, Weimar, Germany, which was a hot mess and chaotic. They were searching for meaning and something to belong to. And one year it was the communists, and the next year it was the fascists. And I'm not saying that... Trump's people are like brown shirts, and I'm not saying that Bernie Sanders' people are like the communists, but it's the same dynamic of this sort of searching for meaning in politics um, that I think motivates both sides. And um, until we fix the structural stuff and Washington actually starts getting stuff done, I mean, I think Lindsey Graham is right about this, is that as long as Washington doesn't, particularly the GOP, doesn't actually deliver the goods, then why not nominate or elect people like Roy Moore? Because at least he's entertaining. Right. right? Um, you have to prove to people that the adults are trying to get are getting stuff done. And if they don't get stuff done, then it is just a TV show. And let's have let's just throw bombs and be silly. And to your point, Trump always had the sense uh, we all sort of ridiculed him. And I don't think the data suggests there's a huge number of people who followed this lead, but that the Sanders supporters could be his supporters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't, as I say, I think in the real world, it's just too, the sociological difference is now too great between being a 26-year-old who's multicultural and yeah. uh, and a 62-year-old, you know, white former steel worker who's Trumpy. And it, but if you just took the, if, take a few, if you looked at them each speaking in interviews and took a few proper nouns out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're quite similar, don't you think? No, I, mean, I think the, exactly right. And, and this is a, one of the points I've been making for years is if you look at any, speech by Castro or Chavez and you take the word socialist and replace it with nationalist, you don't change the meaning of the yeah. sentence, right? Nationalizing things is socializing things and it appeals to the same part of the brain. And I think that you could imagine, I mean, and this gets back to what if Trump had a different brain, right? Um, you could see Trump's message if he knew how, if he knew how to talk, right? He's so much a product of sort of bridge and tunnel populism from New York that he doesn't know how to talk to um, sort of broader, diverse groups than you know than than than, than he does. But if he knew how to talk um, to sort of traditional, uh, sort of more traditional liberals in a way that appealed to them, um, you could see him having gotten a lot of the Bernie Sanders people, yeah. right? Um, you know, Huey Long was really good at that stuff. Um, yeah. Huey Long was a brilliant politician. FDR was good at that stuff. And he was much more of a demagogue than people remember. Um, um, but he was less of a demagogue than his enemies, and he used that to maintain the support of elites. Um, I could totally see a um, sort of a blue-collar, homespun, everyman type. I mean, that's we keep flirting with these people. Schwarzenegger, yeah. Jesse Ventura. Eventually, we're going to stumble on the celebrity who finds the right mix. You know, and, and Reagan, to a certain extent, was that guy um, who knew how to talk to normal people. Right. He knew how to tell stories. He co-opted populism. He won over a lot of Democrats. He was unthreatening, but he was also fairly radical in his approach. And um, I think that, but then thank God, Reagan's heart was in the, and mine were in the right, right place. But you could see someone with Reagan's skills going a very different way and succeeding in the, given the landscape that we have. Yeah, I mean, he was an actor and so forth. I do think that still there's a pretty fundamental difference between, I mean, there was a real commitment to democratic norms. Oh, absolutely, and absolutely. Civility and so forth. I'm which, not denigrating. The no, I know I'm not, uh, nor, and I'm not saying you are, but I, uh, just thinking about sort of the extent to which these things, everything prepares a little bit for the next thing. But 
there is some line that gets crossed when you go from, you know, a certain use of theater and yeah. drama and style for the sake of, you know, a higher a, purpose. Yeah, yeah, which is consistent with the basic outlines I of free markets, freedom, you know, uh, for, for freedom, freedom abroad, and then just kind of going uh, um, a liberal democracy and going a different direction. The Caesar thing, I was thinking about this as you were talking, uh, I guess you said Mike Anton said, uh, you know, we should get our Caesar, or someone said yeah. we, should, we should get our Caesar. But of course, I I don't know about the history of pre-Caesar, late Roman Republic, but my impression is you don't get your, it's not like your Caesar or the other Caesar. Caesar is Caesar. That's right. And both sides lose. That's I mean, the, right. pl- the plebeians are fighting the patricians, I guess. Right, right, right. right, right. But it's not like Caesar wins for either of them. They right. both parties go down in a sense and you have Caesarism, which incidentally, that was also a theme, if I'm not mistaken, this I vaguely remember from my youth, of a certain type of conservative political theorist and political thinker in the 50s and 60s, the threat of democracy descending into what they call Caesarism. Mm-hmm. I think Vogelin talks about this maybe yeah, yeah. and that might be worth also looking at as a guy since we, I mean, we're, we're, this is sort of Caesarism with a, you know, of a peculiarly 21st century American celebrity culture type, you that's know? That's right. I mean, so that, that's but, the problem. There, there's, Caesar had an agenda, yeah. right? I mean, like, and, and yeah. Keith Herberg talks about how Caesar was a public spirited person. He had an idea, a vision. Trump lacks the vision, you right. know? And that's one of the ironies, I think, that people, you know, I'm sure you know people who went into the, Trump administration or interviewed for jobs of the Trump administration. Um, I have a bunch of friends yeah. who were in there in one way or the other or almost went in. And some of the more seasoned guys, one of the reasons why they didn't go is because, first of all, they didn't need it for the resume, right? So the only reason they would go in is to get important things done. And the problem, as Cato Byrne used to say about Reagan, the great thing about Reagan is you always knew where the old man stood on an issue. So it actually liberated you yes. to really go the extra yard to, on a policy thing if you knew he had your back. Other than the trade stuff um, and immigration. And even on those, look what he's done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, you know, so I had a friend who wanted to go in and work for the Justice Department. He was like, the stuff I want to do, it, it would take a year of groundwork to get just close to doing it. And I'm not going to spend a year of my life, give up all my clients, and then... Um, one morning someone says something on Fox and Friends and all of a sudden Trump says, oh, we're not going to do that, yeah. right? And um, Caesar knew how to send a signal to right. his troops. Reagan knew how um, the lack of a coherent ideological agenda has been really tough on Trump's biggest supporters. I mean, I guess there are two areas where it seems I've encouraged people to go in and I think this fits. One is where, where Trump doesn't care at all and he's just ceded authority to parts usually of the conservative movement, which we would more or less agree with. The federal society gets to pick the judges, yeah. and if you, can, if you can go to the Justice Department and help those guys get confirmed, <laughs> that's fine with me. Yeah. And, and and then national security. And well, and then secondly, I'd say areas that are just not political, and if you can go to the FDA and improve drug approval and make medicine work better for America, there's no reason not to do it, even if Trump's president. Right. And then there's the sort of national security, keeping the, the trains on the rails and not letting the four years, if that's what it's going to be, of Trump destroy the country and destroy mm-hmm. the liberal world or the world order that's that's important even if it's personally difficult for uh, general kelly and right. hr mcmaster and stuff so i'm I'm also very i'm so i'm on the whole an encourager of people going in i think maybe you have been too mm-hmm. if they think they can do good but not to go in just to yeah it's a um, and certainly not to go into the, the communication side of the white house to defend yeah, everything yeah. trump says that's not going to be good for your character i wouldn't i think. would stay out of there if, if yeah. at all possible uh, so final maybe question just I mean, who the heck knows? But looking ahead, I mean, well, how does this work? We're on the 10th floor going down, but I mean, <laughs> do you have a gut instinct? 2018, 2020, we have this conversation, and I mean, where, where do you think we are? We, we the country, I'm thinking more, but also Republican Party. Yeah, so movement. I'm, I'm you know, if this doesn't air within the next five minutes. With all the caveats yeah, that we don't know. Change, and, yeah, everything right? Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm, I'm skeptical about any great legislation getting accomplished, and... Um, for all of the usual reasons. And um, if that's the case, that is a greater boon to the Bannon primary everybody movement than any arguments that they make. Right. And um, so GOP dysfunction is will breed more dysfunction. And, um, and breed a real civil war, right? I mean, breed gonna, a real don't civil you think people are underestimating just what it's going to be like to have primaries and Ten states for Senate seats and twenty congressional districts that are real primaries, not yeah, just like yeah. one insurgent here or one challenger there. But I mean, well-funded 
It'll be an campaigns. abattoir. Yeah, no, it'll be yeah, a hot mess. With Trump and, basically on one side and the Senate Majority Leader and the Speaker of the House on the other. We've not really seen that. Right. I mean, in our lifetime. And um, um, I think that will be terrible. It will turn off a lot of people. And even the the better candidates in those races, right? Because, you know, the not every I – mean, I understand why Mitch McConnell wants to focus on people like Sharon Angle and Todd Akin, right? But – we also got Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz yeah. and Rand Paul. So I mean, Mike Lee, yeah. you got Mike Lee. So you can, it's a mixed bag of who the, the the challengers might be. But even if all of the, you know, the better ones win, they will all still be damaged for the general election, um, because there is no good position to take vis-a-vis Trump. If you yeah. take the Jeff Flake position, you're screwed. If you take the, you know. Um, I don't know the the pathetic obsequious the, right position. the, the <laughs> under comrade we don't have to put a name we don't have to put a name yeah on it, under right? comrade Trump the wheat <laughs> harvests will be greater than we've ever seen right um, uh, that's bad for you right particularly in a general election but also with a not insignificant number of Republicans and so it just seems to me that um, it, it has a potential to be a bloodbath I don't think that Republicans will lose the Senate just because of the numbers right you, I, I would trust your judgment on this more than mine. Um, but, but people don't appreciate the other factor here. I and mean, again, it's this Orwell take to drink thing. If the Democrats take back either branch, right, if they, particularly if they take back the House, they then have subpoena power. And then this, if, whether they impeach him or not, I think they would. Um, and whether it would be right to impeach him or not is a different issue, right? We can talk about that when the time comes. But well-run White Houses when there are subpoenas flying around and testimony being compelled and independent prosecutors um, are chaotic. Uh, this White House, where everyone is going to be start looking to cut a different deal and you're going to have, um, talk about politics as a TV show, you know, you give the Democrats subpoena power, you got people taking oaths and pleading the fifth. Um, the idea that we can get anything constructive and conservative done before 2020 strikes me as, as really unlikely. And so I, I think the stakes are, are very, very high in all of this. And I just don't know. I don't know what the best case scenario is. Right. You know, it's just it's, you know, I mean, they're all uh, the good news is there will always be something for us to write about. <laughs> and, talk, and talk about here on and, Conversations. And, and talk about here, yeah. Well, let's hope we avoid various uh, various nightmare scenarios <laughs> and stumble through. There is a lot of ruin in a great nation and all that. And I guess this could be a hiccup, not a... Yeah. Not an inflection point downward, right? I mean, yeah, and 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 even Rome wasn't burnt in a day. <laughs> That's a really wonderful note to end on. <laughs> Jonah Goldberg, thanks very much it's for great to be here. Taking this time, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.